is um, now Eleanor told me and now I've forgotten the 11th in the series. Yep, the 11th of our uh, Spotlight on Stigma webinars. I'm joining today from the lands of the Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation and I pay respects to Elders past and present and extend that acknowledgement and respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander colleagues joining us today. Uh, we've got a, a great lineup today. We do have a change in our program due to unforeseen circumstances. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Eleanor Kama, to tell us what's going to happen today. So over to you, Eleanor. Thanks. Um, so I'm really pleased to introduce you to Professor Annette Brown. Um, so Annette is a professor and distinguished university scholar at the University of British Columbia School of Nursing and Associate Director of Graduate Programs. And her program of research focuses on improving healthcare and health outcomes for Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples affected by health and social inequalities. So um, unfortunately, Nikki Bath couldn't join us today, but we're really pleased to have Tim Walk, um, who is a manager <clears throat> of community partnerships and population programs at ACON. And Tim works across a diverse range of health promotion projects aimed at ending HIV for all and improving health equity. And Tim has over eight years of experience in delivering HIV, sexual health and LGBTQ health um, peer education programs in New South Wales. Um, so the structure of today, first Annette will talk for about 20 minutes, then we'll have some time for Tim to have a response and then we'll move to Q&A. Um, but while both speakers are talking, please feel free to pop any questions or comments that you have during the chat and we can get to those during the end or we can also um, monitor the chat as we go. Um, so I'm happy to pass over to Annette. Great. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome and thank you very much for inviting my participation in the Spotlight series. I have some slides that I have prepared for you today. Um, let's see. Um, this is an image of a uh, totem pole that's on the UBC campus. I'm coming to you today from the beautiful unceded traditional lands of Musqueam people here in, um, in beautiful BC in a Western region of Canada. And I work at the UBC School of Nursing. And this is one of the uh, images and uh, totems that are, are on the beautiful UBC campus. I have some goals for today. I'd like to try to provide a brief overview of some of the strategies that we frame as interventions and research contexts, but as strategies and approaches in actual healthcare contexts, um, all aimed at reducing some of the harms of intersecting forms of stigma. And I'd like to be able to highlight some examples of how these approaches can be tailored and adapted to very diverse healthcare settings. And with all of you, I'd, I'd benefit greatly from discussing how some of these approaches to what we call equity-oriented care may or may not be relevant in the Australian context. I'd like to tell you a little bit about how I came to this work. I'm a, a non-Indigenous person who is a nurse, and uh, my clinical training is as a family nurse practitioner. And my career as a nurse has really shaped my entire research trajectory. Um, for many years, I was an outpost nurse up in very um, uh, northerly remote fly-in regions of the high Arctic, working and living in First Nations and Inuit communities. And um, through my clinical work, I came to understand the value of respectful, dignified approaches to care and, um, and have been really guided by some of these experiences of living and working in community over the years. This slide um, just is an attempt to show you some of the ways in which we have worked in community and with partners in, in the field of Indigenous people's health and also with other groups to co-develop some of these approaches to what we call equity-oriented care. 
um, it's it's really been a, a decades long series of uh, studies that we've been engaging in as part of our research program. First, looking at uh, trying to articulate and identify the ways in which racism plays out in Canadian society in some unique and evolving ways, um, looking to help to define what are some of the key dimensions, the most important core essential ingredients of what we're calling equity-oriented care. I'm going to be showing you some examples of that. We have in our research really tried to implement and work in partnership with community clinics and hospitals and other settings, including Indigenous-led health services, to try to study the impact of these approaches to care in some really interesting and unique contexts with lots of lessons learned. Um, we have adapted some of these interventions for use in emergency departments with an explicit aim of improving care for Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. And now our, our research program really has turned to try to, to engage in what we call knowledge mobilization, which really is working together to co-develop some ways of, of really um, representing some of these rather complex ideas and making them useful in practical ways in everyday healthcare settings. And so um, EQUIP's take on equity-oriented healthcare incorporates what we understand to be as the three key dimensions of equity-oriented care, which are shown on the left. And moving clockwise, these include what we call trauma and violence informed care, which is understanding to uh, work and limit the effects of trauma and violence on people's lives, on their health, on their healthcare experiences, and also the key dimension of culturally safe care, which we're increasingly taking up as an explicit anti-racism approach. We view it as continuous with anti-racism efforts that is reducing racism and other forms of discrimination that continue to play out in healthcare encounters. And our third key dimension that we've been focusing on is this idea of substance use health, which we have been referring to as also harm reduction, but we've been extending that to try to frame things in relation to a notion of substance use health to try to re-emphasize the importance of counteracting the incredible forms, new forms of stigma that are playing out in relation to um, substance use. And on the right, we have 10 strategies that flow from these key dimensions, and they're really intended to guide healthcare organizations, executive level leaders, managers, and whole organizations to try to increase their capacity to provide what we call equity-oriented care. So together, these intersecting key dimensions are forming what we call um, our intervention and or our, the basis of our strategies. So uh, I'm just going to look very briefly at each of the three key dimensions and then show you some examples about how they're taken up in healthcare settings here in the Canadian context. Trauma and violence informed care really is understood as being um, organized around four principles. It really is trying to expand this idea of what is conventionally known as perhaps trauma-informed care, but to focus more explicitly on the impacts of structural violence, the fact that our policies and our healthcare practices and, um, and organizational practices really are traumatizing often to people and can have very significant harms. So what can we do to both acknowledge that and really work to counteract some of that? I wanted to say that we really view um, trauma and violence informed care as a universal approach. So we don't rely on disclosure or knowledge of histories of trauma and violence. We don't view that as necessary. Rather, we think that this is an approach to care or services that improves care for all, not just those who we presume may have experienced violence or trauma. I want to look at this key dimension of substance use health just a little bit more closely as well. We've been partnering with people with lived experience of 
uh, substance use stigma, including a nationally active organization that some of you may have heard of, uh, the Community Addictions Peer Support Association in Canada. They're based in Ottawa. They have a national scope. And CAPSA has provided leadership in attempting to frame for us in Canada this notion of substance use and addiction mm. to reflect a broader con conceptualization of substance use health. And so substance use health is framing substance use in relation to a spectrum of encompassing use, of non-use, of beneficial uses, of occasional risks or harms, of use that may have some ongoing consequences, and also this notion of the DSM diagnoses related to substance use disorders. And we've been finding, at least in the Canadian context, that substance use health is particularly useful and constructive in supporting some dialogues within organizations in a way that pushes back against the pervasive discourses about substance use as moral failings or about substance use as a purely individualistic phenomena that is somehow separate from the structures in our society. And um, we have been finding that this has been a helpful way to enter into conversations that otherwise may have been um, pushing some buttons within the healthcare system. It seems to be um, a little bit more inviting as a way of framing some challenging discussions in healthcare. It's been useful, particularly in encouraging organizational leaders to find ways of explicitly inviting in guidance from community members and from organizations who are so well positioned and, in fact, essential to advising on how to push back against the harms of substance use stigma. Um, I'm going to look just a little bit more closely at the third key dimension of equity-oriented care, that is this notion of cultural safety. For us, it really has been an opportunity to revisit some of the original foundations of cultural safety, going back to the initial conceptualizations by Maori nurse leaders in New Zealand and turning to it for inspiration on how to frame an explicit anti-racism racism intention in our healthcare systems, for us in our schools of nursing, in our medical schools and as policy directives that are being taken up by health authorities and colleges. Cultural safety in Canada is increasingly being used as a way of reorienting our healthcare services to the often very harmful impacts of people's interactions in the healthcare system and in the justice system and in the education system, etc. And as some of you will well know, as I say, cultural safety has been initially conceptualized by, in New Zealand by Maori nurse leaders. And we have been finding it very helpful to continue to help us locate the problem in healthcare practices and policies and not in cultural practices or cultural barriers. And it's been helpful in mitigating some of these harmful impacts of interacting with health healthcare systems. Uh, we've we found that it again is a, a way of opening up conversations about what does it mean to actually enact some actions to counteract racism, stigma, and other forms of discrimination. And here in Canada, it has been a helpful way to point to and highlight some of the unintentional but harmful ways of um, uh, that cultural safety, I'm sorry, that cultural sensitivity training is having in our healthcare systems. We still have a lot of work that's oriented towards this notion of cultural sensitivity. And we have been finding that in some ways it's entrenching some stereotypes in Canada. Cultural safety has helped us to acknowledge that and find some other languaging and perspectives. So um, after orienting you to those three key perspectives and uh, key dimensions of equity-oriented care, I want to try to show you how this is actually taken up in some interesting 
and innovative ways in healthcare settings. Um, we've been working with these three key dimensions and we have been studying their impact in organizations, in a wide range of organizations. And these organizations have been in the primary care sector, in emergency departments, and increasingly in uh, an organization like the cancer care sector, which has a very wide spectrum or continuum of services. And so we've been finding from the primary health care sector that the equity oriented interventions or strategies do not have to be expensive or even time consuming. Many of the strategies are about helping people to be safe and comfortable and avoiding the non judgmental uh, pejorative language that so many people experience and um, and we have some examples from the primary health care study that we've been doing across Canada. So it in, in some cases, it, is it, it has been very, very helpful to involve all levels of staff within an organization, including the people that are called the medical office assistants or the reception staff or the triage staff um, who have been so helpful in finding some seemingly simple but very profoundly impactful ways of changing waiting room environments and or reception services. So in this case, you see a sign tilted on its side that the reception staff decided to change some of the phrasing in signs that people were in, encountering as soon as they came in to book appointments. They wanted to ensure that people didn't feel so dismissed or demeaned or diminished when they were coming in. Um, at another clinic that we worked with, um, they, they decided that because they were serving high numbers of Indigenous people, that there was a possibility of inviting a part-time Indigenous elder who could spend some time um, sitting in the waiting room and just simply talking to people who were waiting to see some healthcare providers, and that really changed the tone in the healthcare um, setting. In another clinic, they decided that there was a great deal of, um, of lack of ability to actually acknowledge and work with people's chronic pain experiences. And so it was quite meaningful for people to come together and have some group visits to acknowledge the ways in which chronic pain is impacting people's lives. And of course, chronic pain, uh, the impacts of that are deepened by poverty and substance use and loneliness and various factors. So this was a chance to acknowledge some of that. Um, and so in our research, this is really an infographic where we have had a chance to actually study the effectiveness of some of these approaches that we're calling equity-oriented care. And this infographic really is, is um, trying to convey that, um, that providing more or higher levels of equity-oriented health care has been shown to be able to predict improvements in several important patient-reported health outcomes over time. More specifically, we found that when patients or people coming for care were rating their care as more equity oriented, that patients were feeling that they were more in control of their sense of how they oh, could manage health care. Um, and, um, and that they could then um, feel a little bit more comfortable about the care that they were actually coming to receive. And when the, these things happened, patients were reporting fewer chronic pain symptoms, fewer depression and trauma symptoms, and an overall sense of improved quality of life. Now, this was uh, very encouraging for us. It was in the context of a long CIHR, which are our equivalent of um, an Australian national funding body of a of a long term study where we were really able to delve in and and try to study the impacts of some of these approaches to care from the patient's point of view. Um, we have been bringing some of these interventions, which really are our strategies, um, into other settings. Um, with my colleague, Colleen Varco, we have been leading some research in, in collaboration with Indigenous leaders in healthcare to um, try to adapt and tailor some of these for emergency department settings, realizing that emergency departments are really a part of and continuous with the primary care sector. 
and emergency departments are often sites where improvements in equity oriented care could have super important impacts. So we were um, attempting to adapt these interventions that were implemented in primary care in some diverse emergency department settings. And we have um, learned a great deal along the way. Um, this slide is attempting to summarize some of those key learnings, and um, I'll highlight just a few. And one is that we see that we need to pay more focused attention to acknowledging the incredible pressures experienced by people working in direct care and in management. That is, we need to focus on how organizations can be called on to better support the workforce. So reducing the harms of stigma and intersecting forms of discrimination requires resources and time. I know I'm speaking to all of you that know that very well, but we're trying to work with executive leaders to encourage them to understand that it, it, it can't be conceptualized as an add-on or as a fringe activity in relation to other work. And we're also um, really strong advocates of going well beyond cycling people through training. Although training can be partially useful for some people in the healthcare sector, there must be opportunities for people to come together to look at how they can create some more structural kinds of changes within any particular setting. To that end, um, we have been working in our research uh, program to try to bring together these various uh, threads of ev evidence-informed pieces of, of knowledge and to um, cast them and, and, and house them in relation to an action kit for organizations. And these are evidence-informed tools and resources that we've tried to package into an actionable set of resources we hope that it, it, it extends beyond some of the conventional educational endeavors to consider how we can prompt more kinds of structural changes within our organization. And I'm gonna just show you a few of these examples. These include some e-learning modules, recognizing that increasing people's level of knowledge is important, but it certainly cannot um, stop there and we, it's necessary, but not sufficient. We also have some animated videos that we have co-created with people in community with lived experience. And um, we have found, at least in the Canadian context, that they seem to be um, catching people's interest, uh, depending on uh, the particular contexts. It's been a very helpful strategy for opening up conversations in organizations about what can be done differently. We also have some action strategies and some evaluation tools, including some measurement tools about how can we really tap into patient reported experiences of care through an equity lens. These are all publicly available. There's been a great deal of interest in the action kit resources in a wide range of sectors, including uh, the substance use workforce sector, including the mental health sector, and most recently in the cancer care sector. Um, and that's been a particularly interesting place to um, introduce some of these ideas. Um, substance use stigma, as you know, is um, perhaps one of the elephants in the room that needs to be unpacked and looked at in relation to uh, cancer care, which tends to be so standardized and protocol based. So this is for us a, a really important opportunity. I'd like to show you very briefly four examples of these types of tools and resources to give you a sense of how they can possibly be used. And then that will be the end of my um, portion of the presentation and we'll open it up for some some discussion. Um, so we have tried to um, take some of these ideas and say, at the bare minimum, what would be the absolute essential things that every health and social service provider ought to know in a more universal way, in the spirit of a universal approach. Um, so we have packaged these in relation to our key dimensions, and we have had this amazing opportunity to co-develop some 
um, some resources with people with lived experience of substance use stigma to really try to make those come alive um, in in a way that we we weren't I, I think doing a good enough job before um, we received some some funding to be able to do that and that felt very important so any one of these um, areas has a whole bunch of, of tools beneath them if you click on them. I wanted to um, talk about some of the tools um, that are not animation based, they're not video based. However, they are um, discussion prompts within organizations. This looks like a rating scale, but it is not a rating scale. In fact, it's it's been really interesting to see how it's been used at a variety of levels within healthcare organizations to stimulate conversations that would otherwise not have occurred to get people talking about their agency or their department or their organization's capacity to think through some actions that might be done in this in the spirit of inviting in input about how to counteract um, substance use stigma increasingly we are framing that as substance use health that seems to be a little bit more palatable and it's been very interesting even just to invite executive leaders to um, dwell on items one, two, or three in this rating scale. There's actually a list of 10 items. Originally, some people thought that we were expecting people to rate their organization, but it, it wasn't that. It was much more uh, a heuristic for prompting some discussion. Similarly, this we have co-developed with um, um, a provincial Indigenous health uh, leadership group to try to develop uh, a tool that could guide some discussion or open up discussions about an organization's capacity to actually action what they're going to do to address anti-Indigenous racism in particular. Um, likely in Australia, you are um, subject to receiving calls and perhaps mandates to develop action plans for addressing anti-Indigenous racism. And we are interested in working with agencies that can move beyond the rhetoric of EDI in Canada Equity, Diversity, Inclusion to actually think about what can be done at a, in a practical way to, um, to better address and more explicitly address anti-Indigenous racism. And I will, um, I think, end with this um, as the fourth example that I'll show you. This happens to be an animation. It is um, an equity walkthrough. You can consider this as being an invitation to anyone within an organization to ask themselves some key questions about how stigma may be experienced by people who are coming into a particular agency from the service user's perspective. Um, it, it can be adapted to, um, to foreground cultural safety. It can be adapted to foreground substance use stigma. It could be adapted to foreground the, this notion of trauma or violence. So um, people have, have found this uh, very helpful and appealing. Um, it's, uh, it can be done in partnership with people who are invited to um, help advise about what are some ways of immediately transforming an environment to counteract stigma, or it can be done at a, a boardroom level. So there's a lot of different ways in which to um, use some of these. And I, I want to thank you so much for um, listening to some of these examples during this kind of show and tell. Um, period, there has been a great deal of energy um, put into the co-development of our research program. It's very much grounded in community perspectives, and I want to hold my hands up to um, all of the, the, the people in community that have um, contributed to the research program known as Equip Healthcare. And I will end with that and perhaps hand it over to you, Tim to facilitate a discussion about how some of this might apply in the Australian context. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you, Annette. Um, I am... I'm just going to... Yeah. Uh, just to say that part of the... Um, 
underpinnings of this seminar series is to always have voice of community centered. So, you know, as, as we said, Nikki wasn't able, Nikki Balf wasn't able to join us. So really thankful for Tim joining in um in very short notice and uh exactly to help us unpack the excellent um presentation from Annette to how you might think about this from uh, a variety of community perspectives uh, in Australia. And um, Tim will do this first piece. And as Eleanor is invited, please put questions or comments in the chat and we'll come back to those. So over to you, Tim. Thank you. I might just share my screen if that's okay. Okay, thank you. That working? We all good? Yeah. Yep, yeah, awesome. So just to reintroduce myself, my name is Tim Walk and I'm the Manager of Community Partnerships and Population Programs at ACON. I'd also like to acknowledge that I am on Wongul land and pay my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today and acknowledge that the sovereignty of this land was never ceded, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. So a little bit about who I am. So I'm from ACON. ACON is the largest LGBTQ plus health organisation in New South Wales. For those of you who don't know, we were established in 1985 during the HIV and AIDS epidemic. Over that time, we've really expanded what we do. So we do HIV prevention and support, sexual health testing, peer programs, mental health and counselling, alcohol and other drug support, and workplace inclusion. Now, for me in particular, within my team, I work with the First Nations Health Programs, the LGBTQ Plus Women's Health Programs, Multicultural and Greater Western Sydney Health Program, Peer Education Programs for HIV and Sexual Health across all ages, all ages, Asian and young gay, by queer, plus men. So as you can imagine, this work is of particular importance to myself and all of the people that I work with. What we really do is this. We work around health equity, and this really matters to us. So I'm really happy to be invited into this. But I do want to just set the stage a little bit around the Australian context before we jump into questions and a discussion. And I think one of the things that would be remiss is not to really understand in Australia that when we're talking about those intersections, we are also talking about the social determinants of health, which we just mentioned. But really, there's we have to vote on whether or not LGBTQ people would be able to get married. We've just had a referendum in which we voted no on recognising the voice of First Nations people. And that's actually the context within which all of our health services, whether they're community organisation, primary health care and so on, is actually situated. And I think that's really important for this discussion and as to why within our context this work is so important. A few things I wanted to really bring up was this notion of anti-racism and anti-Indigenous racism. So I loved Annette when you said moving beyond equity, diversity and inclusion. So within the Australian context, equity, diversity and inclusion has only recently brought in a more of a focus on racism, which I think is going to be more and more important moving forward. The other thing is moving beyond cultural sensitivity. So it's really, you know, it's quite empowering to hear that, that to move from cultural sensitivity to cultural safety and understanding why we need to do that, that actually when we take a cultural, culturally sensitive approach, we're reinforcing stereotypes. But most importantly, what I found really profound around this is actually looking at equity oriented, oriented, sorry, orientated care as structural change. So one of, I guess, the reflections having worked within the LGBTQ space, the HIV space for the last eight years, is that when we look at doing healthcare initiatives for certain communities, whether they're LGBTQ or whether that's around ethnicity or First Nation, we often look at those as a kind of one-off intervention that doesn't actually include structural change. And I think 
this in particular is what is so important within our context. I'm just going to read this quote. Um, so drawing on Sarah Ahmed's work, organisations have inherited what we might consider a history of whiteness, a way of orientating themselves that is maintained through the repetitions of decisions made over time which shapes the surfaces of institutional spaces. Now, what I mean by that is that our policies, our procedures, our practices within healthcare, within community organisations, actually create spaces which are built around a white experience within Australia. And what I love about this is that it's actually challenging that. It's actually bringing to the forefront that we need to move beyond this notion of these kind of one-off interventions and move into a process of going, okay, well, what are our policies? What are the power differentials within that moment of healthcare access? And also going beyond training. Often training looks at this through a two-hour, I guess, training program, <laughs> and you can't really unpack racism and understand how to provide culturally safe services within a two-hour training program. So for me, within the Australian context, this is incredibly important. I also think that, you know, very happy to be challenged on this point. Within the Australian context, as opposed to Canada, the US and, say, the UK, we're a few years behind in having the discussions around race, racism, and how that impacts healthcare. Was incredibly important moving forward. The last point I just want to kind of go into is to really understand this notion of nothing about us without us. So Annette, you talked about the co-developing and we often call that co-design in terms of resources on stigma. And I guess to start off this conversation, when we're talking about creating culturally safe services with, and you gave those really good examples of doing those kind of tools you have to check, I guess, where your service is at. So before I came on here, I actually looked at one of your videos, which was a walkthrough of the services. And it was a really simple video that we can all watch around, okay, well, if you were to do a short walk through your service and you looked at things like your forms where people actually fill in, what does your space look like, what's the language like there, but they're really simple but impactful ways to action this immediately. But what was the process like to actually develop those and how did you ensure that within that co-design process, community was centred and felt heard so that I guess within the Australian context for all of us, we can really learn from that because I think what you're doing is quite a bit ahead of what we're doing here. So I might leave it at that now, just so we can really dive into the questions and I'll stop sharing. There is a thing. Yeah, so Annette, just to kind of bring you in here, what, like how did, through that process of co-design, how did you ensure that notion of nothing about us without us was front and centre, that community really felt heard and a part of that? Thank you. Um, it's it's a super important question. And um, there's also another very important question that has caught my attention in the chat. Um, I see that um, um, our research manager, Nancy Lipsky, has also joined us. And um, we I, I, I want to say about this idea of co-design or co-development, thank you for your comments, Tim. It's um, something that's at the heart of, and in fact, I think none of these resources would have been developed had we not been generously funded and had the time and the resources to meaningfully engage people in a co-design process. Um, we have we have, I mean, really over the decades, always been generating what we call evidence in the scientific communities, um, drawing on the perspectives of, of people in community. And, um, and I guess, hearkening back to um, many decades ago, um, for example, Indigenous matriarchs and elders that I worked with in Northern BC were very keen to um, 
to say, Annette, this is your responsibility about how you use yourself as a nurse, as a, a, a person that is non-Indigenous, that can go into healthcare systems and um, help to agitate for change. So, um, you know, I, I've, I've taken that up, that this work is in the service of addressing community-based priorities. And um, in Canada, despite whatever you think about the Canadian context, there are many numerous, very harmful and evolving new manifestations of um, anti-Indigenous racism in particular and other forms of racism. So um, with our research partners, we have developed some agreements about what actually it does it mean to meaningfully engage in co-design. We have some principles. Those principles are developed with people and shared with people. It becomes a touchstone for all of our meetings. Um, I think that we we may have some of those on the website, we may not yet, um, but that is something for us to consider about just making visible these kinds of principle-based approaches. They would be principles that I think would in some ways be quite taken for granted for many of you, but surprisingly health authorities and agencies need us to articulate them explicitly. Um, yeah, it's been a really interesting process. And I would say time, um, for sure, resources to be able to compensate people for participating with us. To compensate people is absolutely essential to remunerate people for their time and their energy and their intellectual energy. And that has been key, I think, to our success. Thank you for asking. Thank you. I just might lead on to the next one, Annette. So in that spirit, so can you please explain your experiences of when you think the incredible work may become standardised in government-led programs, so really moving from research programs into the practice of doing this work? Oh, Annette, you're muted. Thank you. Um, Tim, it was a little bit wobbly when you were explaining the... Um... The question and if you wouldn't mind repeating it that would yeah. be helpful thank you so can you please explain your experiences ah. of when you think your incredible work may become standardized ah, government right yes. i see it it's in the chat so yeah, thank you so very yeah, much that's yes all right. um and there's another question that i would i would very much um like for us to delve into as well that's in the chat um yeah, so our our work is, um, you know, has really evolved, I would say, over the past three decades. So this is not work that has come kind of out of thin air, if you know what I mean. It has been a culmination of work. And um, we have received some various generous funding from federal agencies. Uh, for some reason, this idea of the three key dimensions is resonating with people in a lot of different contexts. And it might be that that they're very adaptable to um, opening up and prompting conversations in ways that are not um, shame and blame, in ways that may be accepting and acknowledging the pressures in healthcare. And, um, and so, uh, for example, the, 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 the uh, National Public Health Officer of Canada, um, who some of you may know Dr. Teresa Tam um, during COVID, et cetera, has, has also been um, helpful in spreading the word about some of these approaches and the need for some practical strategies. So um, yeah, I think that there's been multiple ways of um, helping to make the work visible through academic publications. I mean, we are researchers and there are academic publications, but that might be <laughs> this much of, of what's prompting things. Um, it's training the next generation of researchers and it's also um, considering the implications for scale up in organizations provincially and also nationally. Yeah. Just a question you were looking at. Do you want to answer that one? I can't find it, that's all. You know, there was a question, Tim, and I, again, it's a little bit wobbly, um, and I don't know if our how our time is. I think we're okay. Um, there was a time about, uh, or a question about um, the notion of heavy use on the Do you want me to read the, the question out? Yes. 
Yes. Yep. Thank so, you. Um, yep. So Adrian said, I like the focus on avoiding pathologizing terms such as addicted, though I'm interested to know what markers are used to define heavy use as the term could oversimplify the complexities of substance use, such as frequency, quantity, context, and individual tolerance. Yeah. Thank you for the question. And I am, I'm going to take that question back to our people that we work with. Um, because I, sh I share that concern. And at the same time, um, some people in community and people in um, the, the substance use sector have asked us if we can try on this um, language around heavy use um, as an alternate to addiction, given the, the moralizing and almost um, panic inducing tone that addiction um, or, or, or maybe it's a legacy that, that this notion of addiction comes with, at least in Canada. Um, we have had some feedback about trying to reframe this in relation to a, a continuum of use. And um, I, I really appreciate this feedback about this notion of heavy use. We do not have a clear or definable set of criteria that would um, categorize substance use in relation to heavy versus not heavy. And of course, it's completely context dependent, so very much so. Um, so I really appreciate that, that comment. And I'm going to, uh, if I can, bring it back to our teams to for us to try to continue to think about. Thank you for that. I'd, I'd appreciate your insights about what we can use to counteract the moralizing discourses it, it, around addiction. Can see um, Adrian's popped his Great. camera on. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that, Adrian? No, no, I was just going to say thanks very much for explaining that. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thanks. Um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to put up your hand as well so that we can get to you. Um, but in the meantime, I just wanted to ask a question, and I think I've asked, asked you this um, separately in a meeting, but I thought it might be useful for everyone else to hear your reflections around how we, um, I guess your experiences of getting healthcare settings to take up this approach. And if you have any tips on, you know, how we could do that, how we can encourage health services to take up this approach as well. <laughs> that's, that's really a big question. And we should have a whole spotlight devoted to that. I'm, I'm very glad that you've asked us that. I don't have any magic answers at all. Um, however, we are really turning our attention, meaning me, my research colleagues, um, particularly Colleen Varco, um, Nancy Lipsky, who's on this, um, on this spotlight, and I, along with some leaders in healthcare, are really trying to, um, are, are, to trying to identify what are those strategies and conditions that that must be in place for people to actually put their money where their mouth is to actually devote resources we in in um in some circles can acknowledge the fact that there there are enough resources it's about choices about how you want to use those resources and so um if we use that as our starting place and acknowledge that um then it's it's a matter of i think um finding some shared um health outcomes that we want to achieve so nobody can argue with the fact that we do need to close the health equity gap in in whatever way that that is in your local community or your local agency and that's going to look differently in different communities. And um, if we can agree on that, then we can start to agree on what are some approaches. Now, lately, Colleen Varco has been um, telling us in our research team that she has been really finding it helpful to lead with acknowledging the pressured context of healthcare and the drain on the healthcare workforce that people are currently experiencing and to lead with that and to not lead as I usually do with what is equity oriented healthcare and here are some strategies because it conveys the message that we're asking you to do even more to add to your workload. And um, I have heard Colleen say that in some circles that she has found that it just somehow, it, it, it gets people off of their defenses um, and just shifts the, the tone a little bit to perhaps create a little bit more of an opening 
for people to think creatively about how you can use resources and time. So maybe I'll leave it at that. Just to build on that, I was wondering, so within some of your research, you have patient reported outcomes and how that has really kind of improved that process. I was wondering if you had insight into the actual healthcare staff and what their experience was within that. And yeah, because it'd be good to know both sides, just especially in relation to thinking about burnout and, you know, our health system being overburdened. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm again, smiling and nodding because these are some of the very things that we're kind of, you know, pushing ourselves to really um, face and, um, and I think tackle in our research program. Um, in some of the, some of our work, we have been trying to measure um, staff's um, knowledge and their attitude and their practices in, in maybe some more conventional ways. And that kind of, you know, describes the situation, but it doesn't really um, get at things like, what is a satisfying working environment for you to be able to cr create conditions so you have something to offer in relation to equity-oriented care? And so we have been um, trying to, um, to, in some ways, open up that as an area of inquiry for ourselves about how can we foster a sense of, of, of staff or workforce um, for lack of a better word for now, wellness. But that's beyond bubble baths, as Colleen says, or beyond, you know, um, doing self-care or beyond just critical self-reflection, but more meaningful structural ways. So we have received just a, a little bit of funding lately um, for to, to help explore that. And we hope to be able to um, tell you a little bit more about what insights we might have, but we would also appreciate your sense of how we could open up that as an area of inquiry. For now, I'm calling it staff or workforce wellness, but wellness isn't quite it. Yeah. It would be really good. Does anyone in the chat have any thoughts around this? So I think from my own experience within our workplace, in the past, there has been a focus on individuals and what individuals can do to support themselves. Now, I love a bubble bath as much as the next person, but a bubble bath is not going to fix structural problems in the workplace around burnout and around, you know, too much work. So does anyone here actually have some thoughts around that? I can see a comment in the chat from Belinda, yeah. including staff in decision-making. Maybe while people are thinking about it, there's a question from Joanne in the chat. So I really like the focus on anti-Indigenous racism in Equip. How have health providers responded to this particular aspect and what practices have been easier or harder to action in health settings? Thank you for that. Um, and, 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 and Tim, I want to thank you for your excellent um, facilitation skills with a, a webinar of this of this size. Thank you. Um, in relation to anti-Indigenous racism, um, that is always um, a, a challenging area for us to move forward. It's, it's one where we feel very um, confident and committed to the strategies that we're using. And, and we also have um, had to have some very challenging and open discussions about the resistance discourses that are inevitable that come up in um, conversations and to offer up some strategies for mitigating those resistance discourses. And so, um, you know, not to only say that everything has to be a tool or res a resource, but we have had to actually, um, I think we have a, a PDF or some kind of a resource that we have as a touchstone for offering up strategies for addressing the ongoing uh, resistance that is encountered in Canada as we always are, are discussing um, anti-Indigenous racism as an entry point for us to consider addressing racism more broadly. So um, and anticipating the challenges and preparing for the disruption and actually acknowledging it has been, um, has been our way forward. Um, these are very challenging um, discussions, but also 
um, they can be very satisfying discussions as you see people turning a corner themselves to say that if we shift the way in which we address anti-Indigenous racism, it is going to be helpful for all of the care that we provide. And it's, it, it, it be, you, you can see that it becomes linked to staff's own sense of having some control and contribution that they are proud of in their workforce, in their workplace. So, um, you know, in some ways, perhaps in Australia, it feels one step forward, several steps back, one step forward, several steps, but we, um, we are, we march on. So thank you. Yeah. There's a couple of um, additional reflections in the chat. So Anna says, I think psycholo psychologically safe workplaces with regard to burnout, workload management, et cetera, needs to come from senior leadership and be remodeled by them publicly. Yeah. Um, Nicole says the burnout culture seems to be something that you people aspire to. Does it mean you're doing more, compromising your personal life, health, mental health, a false sense of loyalty? Um, there's quite quite a bit going on, but I want to get to Emma Williams um, as she's asked a question. Let me just double check. So this, this is a bit of a long one. So um, Emma works with people who live with bloodborne viruses. Often um, people who use alcohol and other drugs might be First Nations, culturally, linguistically diverse or LGBTQIA. Um, so there's many layers. Oh, I can see Emma's joined. Did you want to ask your question online? You're on mute, Emma. Yes, I just needed to unmute. Sorry, We're, I'm here with um, my lovely student, Condice, at the moment. Um, so this is a really good experience for her. So yes, what we find is that people go into hospital. We support people who are very socioeconomically disadvantaged, whose lifestyles have often led them uh, to hospital. They live with chronic conditions, so they are developing comorbidities and they end up in hospital through lots of other things that aren't necessarily related directly to their BBV or to you know anything else that's going on for them their ethnicity their criminal history and yet this is discussed in loud voices with just a curtain between you know that person and the person in the next bay the whole of ED can hear what's going on and then the curtain gets ripped back and everybody knows that that person is either living with or you know has you know has, has a criminal history etc cetera, etc cetera. it's totally inappropriate and this happens so so often that I have clients that say to me I will be dead before I go back into ED that's the only way they'll get me back in there and it's it's just not okay and so I just I would really love um you know it's become a real problem in some of the hospitals here in South Australia just the lack of sensitivity and so it, it, I just wanted to highlight that's a, a real area that we are very aware of and that we really want to, where we really want to confront and address that, that stigma and discrimination as it happens, really. Right, I'll just jump in there because we're, we're just about to run out of time. Sorry, and Carla, can I just, sorry, before you get to the STEMA conference, I just think that it's really important to acknowledge the comments in the chat around deconstructing whiteness culture um, and around the voice referendum and saying we're di against racism is very different to management, taking time to explain what different kinds of conversations about race are respectful and welcomed in the workplace. Just want to highlight those are really important, particularly in the wake of the outcome of the referendum. So and, thanks for sharing those comments. And just to quickly add on to that, sorry, just to wrap up, also just to really, for organisations, to actually look at Annette's work and the work of the team around what that actually looks like, what structural changes are needed around policies, practices, procedures to actually work from an anti-racist framework and to create more inclusive, you know, health access to health. And I think that's going to be really important because often we hear that people are against racism, but what Annette's work is showing us is that, well, what steps are being taken, how are we recording them, how are we reviewing that, how are we measuring them, and how are we being accountable to that process? And I think moving forward, that is so incredibly important. Thanks, Tim.
Yes, thanks. This has just been such a rich um, session as they all are, and uh, we are just about to run out of time. So very big thanks to Annette and to Tim and um, to let you know that we will be running this uh, this conference on UNSW campus uh, in November 2024, where we can hopefully keep having these conversations between now and then, but then have a really focused opportunity to dive in deep to these really challenging issues. Um, so thanks again, uh, Annette and Tim, really appreciate uh, you both being here and Tim, especially at short notice uh, um, and to everybody who's contributed. We'll, we'll see you next time. Thanks very much.